I want to start by saying that uh, we're really at a tipping point right now when it comes to light pollution in this country. The problem continues to grow, but the awareness of the issue has never been higher. And the new uh, technological pro uh, promise of LEDs really presents us an opportunity to stop and even reverse the spread of light pollution and its harmful effects. And I would say that the setting here tonight is really appropriate because New York City has a particularly important role in this moment as it prepares a massive retrofit of its streetlights. It's not too early, it's not too much to say that cities across the country and even the world are watching what happens next in New York. For the decisions made here about lighting will be copied everywhere. The city has a tremendous opportunity to get it right when it comes to lighting the nights, and that's what I hope we'll be talking about tonight, what that means and how we can do it. My own interest in darkness and light comes from growing up in Minnesota where my family built a cabin uh, up in the northern part of the state the year I was born, and every summer we would spend weeks at a time up there. So I had a first-hand experience with real night, with natural darkness, whether that meant standing on the dock under sugary spreads of stars or canoeing in the moonlight or walking through woods so dark you can't see your hands in front of your face. But unfortunately, it's this kind of first-hand experience with natural darkness that we're losing or have lost in the U.S. Estimates are, for example, that eight of 10 children born in the U.S. today will never live where they can see the Milky Way, and that a large percentage will never see the Milky Way, period. And the reason for that is what you see on the image up above us, um, the swamp of artificial light that characterizes our nights. In these four images, you see the relentless march of light pollution across the country is shown by computer images based on NASA photos. Um, a couple of Italian astronomers did this. They used data from 1997, so that's the data they had. They estimated backwards to the 50s and to the 70s and then ahead to 2025 to show us the trajectory of where we're headed if nothing changes. So this is one way to uh, envision the state of light pollution in the country. Here's another way to think about it, this is something called a condensed version of something called the Bortle scale, which is a nine level scale of darkness, starting with nine, our brightest places, and working our way down to one, uh, our darkest places, the kind of primitive darkness. A couple things about the scale I always point out, most Americans live most of our lives in levels five and above. We rarely or never experience darkness any darker than that. So when you ask people, does it get dark at night, it's kind of a trick question for most people. It gets dark, but not naturally dark. The other thing, too, is are there any Wordle scale one places left in the US in the lower 48s? The answer is maybe if you're lucky on night to night, but some people would argue no. In uh, writing the end of night, I borrowed Wordle scale for my table of contents. So I have nine chapters. I start with chapter nine. I work my way down to chapter one. I start with Las Vegas and Times Square. Those are my two very bright places. And at the end of the book, I'm down in Death Valley and some other places like that. Um, along the way, I explore the many ways darkness is so important to us and the many costs of light pollution. We'll hear a lot about those costs tonight. We'll hear from Richard about the human health costs. Just yesterday I was at a conference in Tucson at the International Dark Sky Association where the, their new estimate of the monetary cost of wasted outdoor light is now $100 million, $110 billion a year in this country alone. Um, but I would like to speak briefly, briefly about the ecological costs of our use of artificial light at night. It's good to remember that life on Earth evolved not only in bright days, but also in dark nights, the daily rhythm of natural light and natural dark. More than 60% of invertebrates, that is insects mostly, and 30% of vertebrates are purely nocturnal. Many other species are crepuscular, meaning that they're active at dawn and dusk. For these creatures, our light at night is the disruptor and destroyer of habitat. Some of the species are better known, like the sea turtles in Florida that maybe you've heard about, or the more than 400 different species of migratory birds that are drawn off course by our lights. But most are not. We don't know that much. We're only beginning to understand the tremendous ecological impacts our artificial light 
of our artificial light at night. And I would just say that if New York City or any city is serious about being green, it simply must look at its choice, its use of light at night, including how much it uses, where it uses it, when it uses it, and what kind of light it uses. I would say, uh, when I was writing the book, one of the issues, the maybe overriding uh, idea that I came away with is that it's not that artificial light is bad. In fact, it's a miracle. It's wonderful. We're going to have it. We want it. But it's time to rethink how we're using it. By using light at night more thoughtfully, responsibly, and intelligently, light pollution is one problem that is readily within our grasp to solve. Let me also say one word about uh, an issue I'm sure we'll talk about tonight. It's uh, always an issue when, this is when we're talking about light pollution and darkness, and that is the security issue. And I'll show you two slides that go a long way toward uh, at least, at the very least, illustrating how light at night and security safety is a complex issue. Too often we think that because some light at night can improve our safety, that more light will bring ever more safety. But lights like this one that are unshielded, glaring into our eyes, into, our, into the sky, into our bedrooms, actually decrease our safety. When we shield our lights, as I'll show you in the next slide, we not only uh, reduce light pollution, but we can also then see the bad guy standing in the fence. <laughs> So this is a real typical light in America, uh, quote unquote, security lights. I hope it's obvious, bright lights create glare, they cast shadows, the bad guy can see us. We can't see him until we shield our lights. And I'll just end with such a beautiful image uh, from Arles, the south of France, Van Gogh's image. And with a few words to say that night's natural darkness has always been a vital part of being human. And in our discussion tonight, I hope we'll keep in mind the value of darkness for our soul, our spirit, our creativity, our imagination. Let us keep in mind that we live half our life at night and that darkness, both literal and metaphoric, is part of a well-lived life. We can light our nights in ways that honor this fact so that, quote, well lit means lighting that is safe, efficient, and even beautiful, friendly to dark skies, the environment, and human health, and not simply bright.